Hi, my name is Gerhard Schwartner and welcome to our webinar today. We talk about my favorite subject, negotiation tactics that U.S. sales team needs to win. And it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce two experts. First, Mark Allen Roberts. He is VP of Sales and Marketing with SparkX IQ. And also we have Skip Tucker. He's a master negotiator and trainer. Welcome, Mark. Welcome, Skip. Um, I want to tell the audience, um, this uh, is an interactive webinar. So I really would appreciate it if you can uh, type in your questions in the tool that we have provided as you think of them. And uh, we will interrupt with certain of your questions and then reserve the rest for the end. Fair enough. Um, Mark, tell us about the agenda for today. Yeah, thanks, Gerhard. Uh, we appreciate being invited to serve your community today. Today, we've invited uh, one of our black belt negotiations instructors, uh, Skip Tucker. Uh, he has over 30 years experience uh, serving Fortune 500 companies with negotiation skills, negotiation tactics, and has been a negotiator himself. Um, we're really excited to be able to share some of our content and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Skip. Okay, thank you, Gerhard and, uh, and Mark. Uh, excited to be here today to talk about this, this very, very important tactic of, of improving the performance of your sales force. And you know, the, the one thing that could improve the performance of any sales force almost immediately is this concept of tactics. Um, it's, it's, it's the one thing that, that that really will uh, will help your your organization much more than any else. Uh, could we? Tr uh, I'm trying to transfer the uh, or move the slide here. Can we transfer that over to me? Or maybe not. I'll let you do it. Um, anyway, tactics have been around for pretty much ever. Um, we run into them every single day. In point of fact, we use tactics every day. Now. The sad part, though, is that often when tactics are being used on us, we fail to recognize that they are, in fact, tactics. We often don't realize what, what's even going on. And because we haven't identified them as tactics, we can't counter them. So what we're going to be doing today is going over just a few basic transactional negotiation tactics. And uh, with your permission, this is how we're going to approach it. First of all, we're going to define these tactics, what they are. Then we'll talk about how they work, why they work, when to use these tactics. And then most importantly, we'll just talk about what do you do when these tactics are being used against you? Now, obviously, because of time limitations, this is going to be a pretty quick, down and dirty, very brief overview. Well, this is our first chance to make this interactive. So for everybody participating, what we'd like you to do is use the questions um, box and we'd like to ask you a question. How many of the people online today have received negotiations training, formal negotiations training in your career? Please type into the questions box your answer, either yes or no. I see some very interesting answers here. This is fascinating. Not surprising though, quite a few people have never really had formal negotiations training. Typically that's, you know, been done with buyers. How about you, Skip? What have you seen? Well, that's, that's really an excellent question. Up until about 2007, or so, the ratio of trained buyers and trained sellers uh, that took negotiation classes that I was involved with seemed to be pretty much a 50-50 split. But when the recession of 2008 hit, a very interesting phenomenon occurred. Many, if not most, sales organizations decided to save money by cutting back on their training budgets, while many, a 
if not most buying organizations, ramped their training up. So what ended up happening was that you had a whole bunch of untrained salespeople going up against buyers who had been very well schooled, at least in the art of negotiating. Now that's been coming around in the, la the last few years, but we're still feeling the effects. Buyers are, are using tactics on sales professionals every single day. And the reason th those tactics have been working so well is that a lot of sellers still haven't yet been trained on how to recognize and counter them. And that's what we're trying to do here, at least get the ball rolling and help people, particularly in sales, recognize and then be, be able to counter these basic negotiating tactics. So uh, let's, let's talk about the most basic tactic there is, the very first one. It's truly my favorite. This one is called the flinch, okay? And you all know this one. The, the flinch could be something as simple as, as a raised eyebrow, all the way up to what I call doing a Kramer. You remember Kramer from Seinfeld? When, when Kramer flinched, he, he practically fell to the floor, right? <laughs> And, and, and you've all experienced the flinch before. You give your price to someone and they start looking like they're having a heart attack. The clinical definition of a flinch is the presentation of a negative reaction to the other party's stated position. It's a physical, visible, audible reaction to communicate a message to what you just heard. If you're a parent, you you know this one because you've used this one all the time. In fact, your kids have probably used it on you as well. You've perfected this tactic with your kids. And, and whether it's a raised eyebrow or a sharp intake of breath or a shocked, what? However, however it's presented, the first step in countering the flinch is really the first step to countering any and every tactic, to recognize it as a tactic. Don't get thrown off, don't get intimidated. Understand that, that this is simply a tactic and there are countermeasures you can use. One thing you could do to counter this tactic is simply ignore it. Now, I don't want to say ignore the other person. That's not what I'm saying. But just realize that their flinch is often just a gambit that's tossed out there to get some sort of a reaction from you. So, so don't rise to the bait. Or you could flinch back, counter flinch. I'm going to talk about more... Uh, about more about that with our next tactic, which by the way is one that salespeople encounter every day. And it's a tactic that works better than it should work. This tactic is called the squeeze, all right? And the squeeze goes like this. You, let me set up the scenario. You've done your sales presentation. Things have gone smoothly. You, you, you finally get to the point where you give the client your price. And at that point, they utter the 13 words that really strike fear into the hearts of most salespeople. They say to you something like, listen, I like what you're offering, but you need to do better than that. Why does that tactic work so well on salespeople? I'm going to argue that it works so well because it plays into the fears that we always have that fear that there's somebody out there with a similar product or service at a cheaper price, right? And if I'm a buyer and I can find those insecurities, boy, you can just bet I'm going to use them against you. Now, of course, if that was really true, that they could get the same thing cheaper someplace else, then why would they even be bothering to talk to you? Good question. Also, another reason the tactics work, the tactic works so well is that because when you hear people say, I like what you're offering, but you need to do better than that, you're probably not thinking, okay, they're using a tactic on me. Instead, most people are usually thinking something along the lines of, hey, they just said they liked what I'm offering. They like me. I'm close. They really like me. I'm on the short list. All I've got to do to get this deal is what? Lower my price. This is a great time to have another interaction with everybody online. In the question box, simply type in yes or no. How many of you online have heard You've got to do better than this. Well, it looks like you nailed it, Skip. Quite a few people have had buyers say that to them. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a very common, very, very powerful tactic. And again, as I said a few minutes ago, the first step in countering this tactic is recognizing 
that it's a tactic and identifying it as, as a tactic. Once you've done that, you make sure you stay away from the very last thing that you ever want to do when dealing with this tactic, and, and which is to do what most people do, and that's to respond with, where do you need me to be? Don't say that. It's, it's the automatic response to a tactic like this, but try not to say that, because if you do, what are you essentially telling them? That you do have flexibility, that you can do better. So let's talk about a few countermeasures you might be able to use for the squeeze. You need to do better than that. One thing you could do, and this is a powerful one too, would be to get them to clarify exactly what they're talking about. And you could do that by asking one simple question, better in what area? Now, you're assuming that they're talking about price, and in point of fact, they probably are, but they might not be. They might be referring to any, any, any number of things. It could be terms and conditions, delivery times, specifications, pretty much anything. So before you start considering making price concessions, make sure that price is what they're actually talking about. But just for the sake of argument, let's say that it is price, that that, that is what they're talking about. One way to counter it is to do what we just finished talking about, flinch. What? What? You want us to do better than that? Hey, we're, we're already offering you 30% more than our nearest competitor. Man, we ought to be charging you 30% more. At that point, they might start to be thinking to themselves, oh, maybe that's not such a bad deal after all. Another way to deal with the squeeze is to claim limited or no authority at all. I don't have the authority to do that, or my boss isn't going to let me do that. If you do that, who becomes the restrictive force there? It's not you, it's the boss. There's another one isn't that, that, um, um, that works. Most well. boss, sorry for butting in. Isn't that what there most boss salespeople are trained to do? Oh, they're trained to do that, and, and they, they do that very well. There's always a higher authority when you're going out to buy a car, and a lot of people hate that. I had an old guy tell me once, I told him I hated that back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with a sales manager. And he said, you want to know the secret of never having to do that? I said, yeah, lay it on me. And he said, pay the price of the car. And <laughs> it sounds, yeah, I know it sounds funny, but that's exactly what's going on. When you say, I don't want to pay the price of that vehicle, you're saying, let's play, let's play the game. And understand these guys have been trained to play the game. So limited or no authority is, is a very powerful tactic that you can use. In fact, in our society, we've been trained to want to have as much authority and as much power we have. But we say that you actually have more power in a negotiation with less authority. The question isn't how much authority do I have, but how much authority don't I want in a negotiation? There's a lot of power in limited or no authority. That's actually a, a different subject and we can we can discuss that in, in great deal uh, at a later time. All right, another one is, is this. Obviously, and everybody that's in any sort of sales here knows this, that the, the job of sales is can be incredibly rewarding, right? But it can also be incredibly tough. Talking with potential clients isn't usually uh, a matter of, well, here's what we can do for you, blah, 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 what do you think? Great, I'll take it. Now, <laughs> It would be great if it was like that. It'd be nice if it was like that, but it's not. It often involves a lot of negative comments that are thrown at you. Think about it. If you were to believe what a lot of people tell you when you're making sales presentation, what would you deduce about your price? That it's, that it's too high or too low? It's probably too high. Your product, well, it's not as good as I thought. What about your competition? Well, they're just as good as we are or better. Now, again, it's not true, but it certainly has an emotional effect on us when people do this. So how do we bring this distorted picture back into focus? We call this, by the way, throwing junk. First of all, recognize that these negative comments about your price and your product are just tactics, throwing junk. They're all designed to lower your expectations. A slight variation to throwing junk is this. Have you ever had someone say something to the effect of, Listen, I can get the exact same thing at one of your competitors for less. Now, that's another tactic that we refer to as competitive leverage. This one is one of the oldest tactics in the book, and it works great. It's the buyer's best friend. You know why? 
because it works and it works like a charm. Salespeople don't know how to deal with it. But think for a moment, we mentioned this earlier, they may be telling you they can get the same thing cheaper someplace else, but if that were really the case, why on earth are they even bothering to talk to you? So with this tactic, as with all of them, the goal of the other side is to get you to think of the negotiation as a purely transactional situation and to get you to focus exclusively on price. But here's the secret that they don't want you to know. If you don't focus on price, the price won't work. The, me, the tactic won't work. This is a good time to ask for participation once again. If you believe what buyers tell you, what is the primary thing they use to make their buying decisions? Please type in your answers in the question box. We're seeing a few price, price, quality, good. Availability, price. But does this surprise you, Skip? No, not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. Um, now, price is, is what is almost always going to be number one on a, on, a, on a question like this. But here's a little secret. The vast majority of purchasing people are not primarily interested in getting the lowest price, even though that's what you might hear from them, right? All I'm interested is in is getting the lowest price. That may be true for some buyers, but but not the, the majority, right? We preach all the time, don't talk price, at least not when you're responding to these tactics. Because if price isn't the major concern, if it's not price, what do you think the major concern is? And the answer is value. One of the things we encourage uh, our attendees at our seminars to consider, to ask themselves, is what we would call the value question. And the value question it asks, what are some of the limitations to the other party from going with our competition? And if you spend just a little bit of time considering this, you might discover that there's a whole list of things that might fit that bill. And it could be things like time. Time's a big one. It takes a buyer time to analyze all the different proposals that are being made to them. Uh, all the different things that are going on with these proposals. Does a buyer have time to do that with every single vendor that submits a proposal? Often the answer is no, they don't have enough time. You might be there right now. Another thing might be your track record, your company's track record. The better, the better your company's track record is, obviously, the stronger your position is going to be. Another one might be what? Preferences within the buyer's organization. And that might be personal preferences from the buyer himself, or they could have pow the powers that be saying, look, you can go with anybody you want to go with. You can talk to whoever you want to go with. But at the end of the day, I want you to do with business with, with the XYZ Corporation, your organization, because they've had bad experience in the past with a, with a, uh, with a, with a competitor or competitors. Delivery times. That's a big one. A lot of people, delivery times. Somebody may be telling me they can get me a, a cheaper price, but what aren't they telling me? It's not available for six months. That's like the old story of the guy goes into the butcher shop and asks his butcher, hey, Jim, how much are the pork chops this week? And the butcher looks at him and says, how much are they this week? Same as they are every week. They're $9 a pound. And the guy flinches. This is $9 a pound. The guy across the street has them for $6 a pound. And the butcher says, wow, six bucks a pound for pork chops? That's a great deal. You ought to buy your pork chops from him. And the customer says, well, I can't. He ran out of them yesterday. Well, okay, fine. After I run out of mine, I'll sell them to you for $3 a pound. So delivery times or availability. Others might be geographical considerations. You might be located five miles away from your, your customer, and their, your nearest competitor might be 500 miles away. That's going to, the price might be the same, but the shipping costs are going to be different. We mentioned quality. Somebody mentioned quality in, 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 the, uh, in the questionnaire. Uh, uh, personal, professional relationships. Here's one. Maybe the buyer isn't even aware of some of the competitors. Traditionally, who's usually more aware of the competition? The buyers or the sellers? And the answer typically is the sellers, unless 
unless the buyer has been in the business for 20 or 30 years and the seller just broke into the business. Typically, sellers know more about the competitors than the buyers do. And that's the problem. See, sellers often believe it when their customers, the buyer says that they're making their decision to buy based solely on price. It, that's like saying people only ever get married for money. Now, it might be true that some do that, but most of them are thinking about other things. Now, here's the, 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 the $64,000 question. Will a seller ever find out about a buyer's limitation to use the competition if they lower their price right away? Of course not. That's why this concept of time is so important in, in negotiation. If, you, if you're not so quick to come to the point, if you get to know the other person and their organization, the more limitations that you discover that they have to use your competitors. And the more limitations you discover, the more power you have in that negotiation. All right, let's talk about one more big countermeasure that works pretty well with any tactic, and that's this. Silence. Don't say anything. Just stop talking. Silence is an incredibly powerful tactic in any negotiation, primarily because we in our society, in Western society, we tend to get very uncomfortable when it gets quiet. We feel this overwhelming compulsion to fill any void of silence with some sort of noise. Have you ever done that before? You're the first person home after work, and the first thing you do is you go into the house and you turn the television on or turn the stereo on, and then you walk out of the, the, the room just to have some noise in the house. That's why you have a radio in your car, a scene player, an MP3 player in your car to have some noise. We're uncomfortable with silence. Now, in a negotiation, that noise takes the form of talking. And think about it. Silence on your part almost forces the other party to do what? To start talking. And when they start talking, you have a much better chance of getting a lot more information out of them. What some of their pressures might be, some limitations they may be having. Try using silence in a negotiation. It'll pay off well. I know a lot of people might feel uncomfortable about this. If you tried this and you just stop talking, it's going to feel uncomfortable. But if it's uncomfortable to you and you know what you're doing, think how much more uncomfortable it's going to be for the other person. Try it. This person will start yammering away and you, again, might learn all sorts of very, very interesting information. Hey, Skip, we have a question that came in. Um, it says, sure. I've heard a key part of negotiation is knowing when to walk away, the walk away point. Could you explain this a little bit and why it's important? Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's actually an integral part of the planning process for any negotiation. Typically, it, it goes back, I have to kind of back up a little bit because we have to talk in this case about uh, the, the, uh, the planning for any negotiation. And there are really three fundamental planning questions that need to be answered for any negotiation. The questions are, what do I want? All right, what do I want? What are my alternatives? And we call that the BATNA. Um, and the third question, as you just mentioned, the third question is, when do I walk? When do I walk? That the reservation value is, uh, that's what we call our RV, a reservation value. That's your walkaway point. It's the answer to the question, what am I truly willing to accept? For a salesperson, the question is, uh, how low am I willing to go? What's the least amount I'm willing to take? For the buyer, it's going to be the opposite. How much am I willing to pay? That walkaway point or reservation value, and again, we usually just sort this to RV because it's easier, easier to say, that could be a number. It could be a set of terms or anything really that beyond which you're not interesting in, in, interested in continuing the deal. Now, the unfortunately, the important thing about this is that too many people will get to their walkaway point, their, their bottom line, their RV, and then blow right by it. With that, what ends up happening is that a bad or a one-sided deal occurs. So when and if you do reach that walkaway point, 
you're going to end up with a situation that we re refer to as Tioli, take it or leave it, a take it or leave it situation. Now, another word of warning here, don't let these tactics or the person using these tactics get under your skin. You know, recognize that, that, that the tactics that I talk about, go ahead. That's actually another question. It says, how do we get into a negotiations mindset? Specifically, how not to let these tactics get under my skin? So it looks like you're yeah. about to start that. Um, yeah, exactly. Boy, I, I, I couldn't have done that if I planned it. Um, yeah, if, 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 don't let that happen. Remember, that's what they're, they're being paid to do. The, all these tactics, the flinch, throwing junk, the squeeze, there are hundreds of negotiation tactics, and they're all simply part of the negotiating process. As I said, these people are, are simply playing a role that they're being paid to play. Don't overreact. Don't get desperate. Don't get scared. Certainly don't lose your temper and become combative. Negative emotions like anger, fear, or, or even, even the feeling of not being valued or taken seriously can, can cause negotiations to spiral out of control and, and end up destroying hard-earned relationships, hard-earned long-term relationships. So don't let any, I call them emotional histrionics or oratorical fireworks rile you up. Remember, it's just all part of the game, all right? Um, by the way, if, if, if during this time, if, and we'll leave this up for a while, if you'd like more information about some of the things that we're talking about, uh, we'd like to invite you to visit our website, um, which is up here at www.spasigma.com, or check out one of our YouTube videos. The one that is listed up here is called Negotiation Masterclass, uh, and you, there are a couple of different URLs you can use. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact Mark. Our, uh, Mark is our VP of Sales and Marketing at Sparks IQ. Yeah, with that's that. 413-8552. But with that, is there any other questions, Gerhardt? Um, with your yeah, experience well, serving thank so you. many teams. Uh, uh, Skip, you uh, how do you smoke out the, the hidden uh, decision maker? Um, you know, uh, in the the question I didn't say that but um, I get that many times um, especially when I talk to a CEO and they're tricky negotiators because you think you they're, they're the decision makers and then all of a sudden they let you know that uh, you know I need to talk to my uh, division manager about this first um, how do you um, know in advance uh, what the uh, hidden sticks and stones are? Again, great question, Gerhardt. And there's no, I get no magic bullet here. A lot of people do understand that this concept of, of limited authority is a very powerful negotiating tactic. When you're negotiating, uh, especially with people from the Far East, uh, rarely is the person with whom you're speaking going to be the uh, the the one who's pulling the strings in in those societies decisions are made more by a consensus of opinion than a centralized authority but there'll always be one person that can have veto power typically that's the person that's not saying anything in the room but in in our society again most people like to show off that they have the authority and they don't want to be able to uh they don't want to have to say well i'm not the one that has the, the, the final authority on something like this. And it happens, my, my advice when that does happen is go with it, understand that that's part of the negotiation process. It's something you might be doing as well. Don't let that throw you off track. Uh, you may have a little bit more work to do. It, it, as far as identifying who that is, that's a really tough question. I don't have a magic bullet, I wish I did. All right, thank you. Um, you know, here's the next question, um, and I'm really interested in what you have to say to that. What sure. is your definition of a, what's your definition of a good negotiator? Yeah, my definition of a good negotiator. Well, um, I'd say it's more than anything else, somebody who listens a lot more than they talk. Uh, a person who's, who's 
one of the things we talk about in our negotiation seminars is uh, it becoming a detective when you are a negotiator and and finding out about the other party, what's going on with the other person, what are some of their pressures and their problems and their their whole situation. You do that by doing what detectives do. You ask questions, you look for clues, you you um, you you keep asking questions and you don't you don't stop with with this. But the big one, more than anything else, I think it's it's actually listening more than you talk. If if somebody can can do that, if they can they can they can stop talking as much as they do. And for me to say that, that's kind of ironic since that's what I do for a living. But to stop talking from for for, uh, uh, for a while and listen to what the other person has to say, and to also realize that in every negotiation that you ever get involved in, it's the people that realize that they've actually got more power than they think they do because the other person has a whole bunch of pressures and problems that they're dealing with at the same time, probably as many as you do, if not more. But unfortunately, what most of us think about is not what the, the pressures are on the other side, it's what are our pressures and all the things we have to deal with, not realizing that the other person has those pressures too. See, there's no, there's only one of two reasons people will talk with you in a negotiation. Either they've got to feel like you've got something to offer them, right? Or they're lonely and they don't have anybody else to talk to. And that's pretty much it. There's a reason they're speaking to you because you've got something that they want. And if you can keep that in mind, it'll help you be a better negotiator. Those two things I think will, I've had people ask me this before, if I could do one thing to improve my negotiation skills, what would, what would it be? And I'd say, well, don't talk so much and listen more and realize that the other side always has pressures on them too. You've got more, more power in this negotiation, negotiation than, you, than you originally realized. I like that, thank you, Skip. Um, it reminds me of what um, Gerard Nienberg once said. He was sort of the father of negotiation and he uh, wrote a book in the 80s about um, negotiations and sales. And I uh, asked him, what's the purpose of a good negotiation? And he said, the purpose of a good negotiation is not to haggle over who gets the biggest slice of pie. Um, the purpose of a good negotiation is to sell pies for everybody. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's a, a, another very big thing that, that uh, this is a whole seminar worth, not just webinar, but the, the fact that there's, there's transactional negotiations that are just that, basically, they're distributive. The pie is a, a fixed, fixed size and whatever I get, you can't have. But the, when we talk about win-win or, or relational type negotiations, the pie isn't fixed. You bring other issues to the table so that you can grow the pie. So instead of five apples plus five apples equals 10 apples, if you can increase that, that total number of apples to, to 13, instead of each of us getting five, you might get, you know, you might get six and I get seven. Now it's not a 50, 50 split, but we both end up with, with more than what we started with at the very beginning. And that we've expanded the pie and that's where, where true satisfaction comes in. Thank you, Skip. Um, here's a, a, a more nuanced question. Um, I just wanna warn you because I happen to know the person who is asking that question. Um, how do you prepare to respond to a buyer and procure, uh, uh, procurement tactics while retaining a biocentric and supportive mindset toward your buyer. Yeah. Um, well, I would I would go back, and I, I have to answer this in kind of a fundamental way because it is it, it's it's a, it's a very involved question with a lot of different permutations, but it's also a very basic question. And I have to go back to the, the basic thing we talked about earlier is to is to realize that this is that that this is buyers are being paid 
to find this information out, to get the best deal they possibly can from you. Now, remember, best deal does not always mean lowest price. In fact, rarely does it mean lowest price. The best deal is, is the best deal for, for the buyer, which is what they're being paid to do. But at the same time, you're being paid to get the best deal for your organization as well. So recognize that this is just part of the game. And, and to go into a negotiation with a, a mindset of cooperation rather than competition. Now, there's always going to be competition in every negotiation. And you, have, you can't be naive and think, well, okay, I'm, all I'm going to do is cooperate. Uh, I've heard many, many people talk about that. That's the way you get quote unquote, win-win deals is that, that I'll cooperate fully with them. They'll cooperate fully with me. And in that way, we'll go home, both home, go home very, very happy and both satisfied. But they never, the answer to the question is, what if you cooperate fully with them and then they don't cooperate fully with you? So we're not saying be naive. We're not saying uh, uh, be child, childish and go in there and just tell them everything that's that's on your plate. Um, uh, you You do this by give exchanging information a bit by bit mutual disclosure back and forth until you can build these long-term relationships it's not something that can be done in a in a in a short period of time these are lo long-term relationships because they take sometimes a long time to to build up uh, and this is another thing about our society that's different from most other cultures is that we have this tendency toward to, uh, towards going towards immediacy and instant gratification and other cultures tend to take more of a long term and we should be doing that more as well as as, as they do yeah and uh, you mentioned other cultures so i know that um when i went to morocco um i had a conversation with a a salesman who was selling rugs in a in a manufacturing uh, office and um and we had tea and we were just talking about sales and he said you know if if an american comes in or a german comes in uh, this rug for example is twelve hundred dollars um if a local moroccan comes in that drug is three hundred twenty dollars um and um if um somebody comes in and has a conversation with me and engages me in the negotiation my with a foreigner my bottom line is about eight hundred dollars so if somebody doesn't negotiate he said i almost feel insulted it's 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 very very interesting i also have uh have gone abroad a lot and been negotiating in in uh particularly in the far east and it's the same type of a thing they uh they expect to negotiate in fact they're almost insulted when you don't and and uh, they will set a price point on on a, on a product that that most people, most Americans anyway, will just pay. They'll say, okay, oh, twelve hundred dollars for that for that rug. That's a that's a great price. Here you go. But how else are they going to find out what you are going to pay unless they leave themselves a lot of room to negotiate? You might, they don't know whether you'd pay 1200 or if they start at 1000 they'll never know that you would have paid 1200 So absolutely, this is just part of the, of the culture. And, and again, they take advantage of the fact that most Americans don't like the process of negotiation. We feel it's cheap and chintzy and we shouldn't be doing it. It's not a nice thing to do when in fact it's, it's just part of doing business. So really what you're saying is you need two mindsets. One is the game mindset. So you adapt to the culture that you're dealing with. On the other hand, uh, you want to have uh, a realistic mindset, uh, like uh, what you said earlier, the walk away price. Um, I think when you negotiate uh, and buy something, you, you want to have a walk away price as well, correct? And Exactly. And that walk away price, the reservation value, that's part of the game. That's part of the game. So yes, right. it's, negotiation is a game. I'm not saying don't take it seriously. Uh, you, you do need to take it seriously, but you ought to think of it as, as you're playing a game. It's not, you should, don't take it personally. Don't get upset. Don't get 
frazzled by the other side. It, they're, they might even be doing it to get you frazzled, but again, that's part of the game. And if you don't let it get under your skin, it will serve you so much better. All right, next question, thank you. Um, how long do you sit in silence? What if they don't respond? What next? Well, there's an old saying, I'm sure you've heard this, that he who, he who speaks first loses, he who talks first loses. And I, I always like to say that that's, that's kind of an incomplete truism. It's, it should be he who speaks first and says something stupid loses. So if you are gonna break the silence, break it for a real good reason, giving information, helpful information, um, something that will further the cause of the negotiation, but just to, just to speak, just to break the silence because you're uncomfortable with it is, is not always a, a very good uh, a tactic. Um, how long would I go? Yeah, it's, I don't think I've ever been tested. I've done this many, many times, and typically something happens where the, the silence is broken by the other party. But if it's not, if it's not, at some point, if you realize they're doing the same thing you are, you might, you might both agree to, to move on to another issue and revisit the issue that you're talking about now. But, but it's not, it's, it's, it's more along the lines of, of not talking and and maintaining that for as long as you you can as long as you can do it at some point and you'll know what that is at some point you'll realize that okay if this is this is now getting to the point where nobody's saying anything maybe i might want to get started it's like one of the things we say in negotiation is don't make the first concession and that might be that's good advice the person who makes the first concession is usually the one that comes out worse in the negotiation but if if the other person has taken the same training that you have, and they're thinking the same thing you are, I shouldn't be the one to make the first concession. And you both learned this, this trick about, about silence. Now we're just eyeballing each other and nothing's happening. One way to break the ice of a frozen negotiation, we, we say is to offer some sort of a minor concession on a minor issue rather than something major, just in order to break the ice. And often what happens is when you make a minor concession on a minor issue, the other side will come back with a, a bigger concession on a bigger issue. So we amend that rule about don't concede first to don't concede first on major issues. Thank you. Um, somebody's asking, what does Spark X IQ do? And uh, I think you have some explaining to do because you've recently changed your name. So tell us the story. <laughs> Well, Spark, Spark's IQ was actually two different companies. It was uh, uh, Strategic Pricing Associates. I think it actually still is until tomorrow when the, the official name changes, but, uh, but strategic, strategic Pricing Associates, and they've been around since the, uh, the mid nineties, and uh, they help companies with algorithms get the right prices, uh, uh, reach the right prices rather than just, um, uh, uh, cost plus they have algorithms so that 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 um organizations can price their products correctly for maximum value maximum profit and but our president david uh, bowders found that that while the algorithms that he had that the spa said that the strategic pricing was helping these companies set the right pricing they were having problems getting their customers to get that pricing and they hadn't been trained in negotiation uh, initially. That's what the, the company was doing. So SPA Sigma was formed to train how to do negotiation. And then we found there were other things that they needed training in too. Uh, personality assessment, relationship training, sales training, uh, uh, profit training. And so that's what, uh, what that part of the company does is, is that we do the training. So we would say that SPA or Strategic Pricing Associates help companies set the right pricing and SPA Sigma help companies get the right pricing. But now it's being kind of formed into, into one organization called Sparks, which is SPA and then the RX, I believe is what, what it is, is kind of like a RX, like prescription. 
And so SPA prescription and then IQ, intelligence quotient, we call our, our negotiating training NQ for negotiating quotient, personality quotient, PQ, profit quotient, uh, relationship quotient, sales quotient. These are all aspects of training that we do. So uh, thank you, Skip. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your views on body language. How important is body language in negotiations? Not as important as you think. Uh, that's a, a, a body language is a is a a big thing. It was a very big thing for for a long time reading people's body language. But that's something that I've I've addressed in in some of my seminars. If I stand there with my arms crossed, what does that mean? I would ask my my attendees, and people would say, "You're closed. You don't want to talk. You're you're angry." Uh, then somebody would say, "You're cold. <laughs> um, it, 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 you're you're trying to throw us off." And it could be anything. I, it might be just that's the most comfortable way I have of standing. It, it it could mean that I'm closed, but it might not mean. So I wouldn't. I I don't put a whole lot of of uh, credibility in putting a lot, well, let's put it this way. I don't put a lot of weight on body language. I do pay attention to it, but what's a much better indicator is what we per call personality quotient. And that's reading another person's personality based on the Myers-Briggs uh, 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 testing that, uh, that has been done for a long time. We've kind of refined that. We have a, a young lady that's uh, Heidi Preeb that's written books on that, that has done some seminars and webinars for us and, and, uh, and online material for us and on how to not only read the other person's personality, but then how to reach them. We talk about the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But with the personality quotient, uh, that switches it around to what we call the platinum rule, do unto others as they would have done unto them. How do you reach these people? Well, you address them, you give them information in a manner that they want to receive that information the best way they want to receive information. It's a, it's a fascinating study and it's a much, much better indicator on what first, well, somebody is, is thinking and, and perceiving information than body language ever will be. Well, uh, that, that I, uh, I could talk for hours uh, with you, but we have a limited amount of time. Um, there is a, a couple more questions that we need to cover. And okay. then uh, we need to close it. Would, would you say that being skilled at negotiation is being skilled at reframing value perspectives? Good question. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, you have to be able to reframe, reframe value perspectives in order to, to find the, the, the best deal for both parties. But again, that comes with research. That comes with uh, investigating, uh, finding out information from the other party, finding out information about, about their product, about their company, about them personally, and, and sharing information, mutually disclosing information uh, to each other a little at a time so as not to make it one-sided or the other. That All of that is, is part of negotiation, but uh, of course, that's a very, very important uh, uh, topic. Here's another question. Do you believe we are always negotiating or should you only negotiate after selling is complete and you're trying to close and resolve buyer concerns? Uh, the first thing you said, I think, I think, I don't think a negotiation is ever really over. We're constantly negotiating. We, we start negotiating as, as soon as we're born practically. And, and uh, it's, it's all, it's all negotiation. We don't look at it sometimes. We don't refer to it as negotiating, but that's, that's what negotiating is. It's, it's, it's life. It's, uh, it's interacting with other people. Um, uh, I think it was uh, Francis Bacon said that all negotiation is to work, to discover, and to take risks. And that's what we do throughout our life is, is, is we work, we discover, we take risks. We're negotiating with our friends, our families, our coworkers, our, our business associates. Uh, it's, it's all negotiating, but we don't call it that. We call it interaction. And that's fascinating. I, um, I didn't expect that quote, but it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, next question. Can you share your most memorable negotiation experience? Wow. Um, 
boy, that's a good question. Uh, there's there's a lot of them. And my most memorable ex negotiation experience, um, probably. You know, it, it's funny. It, it it it's not a business experience, but it was. Um, uh, I was was buying. I was trying to buy a watch in China, and yeah. um, and I was I was over there doing some business and had a few days off, so I went shopping and and um, I asked a few people. And they they directed me to this one big building where people were selling things, and and then I they took me downstairs into what looked like a uh, a uh, <laughs> it looked like a storeroom. And we're walking in among all these boxes, shelves and shelves of boxes. And they stopped at one shelf and there's two Chinese gentlemen and they pushed on the shelf and it was a false door and it opened up and we went out in behind the, the, the shelves and back into this, this alcove where there were a, a few other uh, Chinese people. And I'm thinking, nobody knows where I am. This is, this is very strange. And I'm I'm starting to get very very nervous. And the first thing they do was, was to serve me tea, like you said, Gerhard. They served me tea, and we sat down and we talked about our, our personal lives, who you know what who I was, who they were. We talked about our families. This went on for about oh gosh, at least an hour before we ever started talking about price on on the price of the watch, and um, and then we we negotiated probably another two or three hours and I walked out with what I felt was that was a, a, a pretty solid deal on this watch. Um, but it was, it was kind of scary to begin with because I really didn't know what was, what was going to happen. I think that's probably, probably the most memorable one I ever had just because it was one of the most unusual. That is a wonderful story. And not the watch. What, did you use any negotiation tactics that you remember? Every, every one of them I knew. Every single one of them. It was it, everything I tried was was being countered expertly, and so then I was coming. But they didn't expect an American to to negotiate as hard as I was negotiating and to push as a, a tough a deal as I was I was pushing. Yeah, they also didn't expect me to walk away because I didn't even know where the door was on this one. But but. Um, I did. I threatened several, several times. No, that's it. You know, if we can't, if we can't do this, then then I have no interest in continuing this negotiation. Basically, a take it or leave it. Then they would offer something else, and so I would would revise my offer. It went back and forth, back and forth, and it got to be the point where I was almost family to these people by the time we were done. So somebody was writing about emotional intelligence and uh, how important it is in a negotiation. Uh, can you, is this something you can prepare for? You know, it's changed a lot of, uh, the traditional view is that emotions don't have a place at the bargaining table for the longest time. Uh, you know, you, you had to be Mr. Spock when you were, when you were negotiating and that, that viewpoint has, has changed dramatically in the last, maybe the last dozen years or so that a lot, it's been found that, that you, the people with whom you're negotiating will often take their cues of 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 from emotion from your emotions. If you're in a good mood and in a, in a cooperative mood, that tends to make them more in a in a good and cooperative mood as well. Um, it's it's um, it's it's just interesting that that uh, that. You have to be aware of your negotiation, your your your, your emotions very early on, your uh, so that you can you can if if you do start feeling your emotions rise up, you're a good position to do and say things that'll help you advance your goals. If you're unaware of your emotions when they begin to rise, you're more likely to do or say something that's going to jeopardize the relationship and undermine your goals. So. So I would say, yeah, that, that, that emotion, emotions that about, in fact, I'm writing an article on that right now. And it's interesting that you, that you would bring that up, um, that, that, uh, I think negotiations absolutely have a, a, a place in negotiations. Yes. Don't let them, don't let the emotions on their part get in your way either. Remember, it's just all part of the game. 
So what do, what do you do if a buyer genuinely gets upset um, in the negotiation about something that's very material, like uh, like the price of delivery? Um, how do you diffuse that? How do you manage? Uh, you know, there are always two things: the the buyer's emotion, and the the other one is uh, your your limitations uh, because you can only do so much for a buyer. Right, exactly, and and again, recognize that that what's probably happening is they're is they're using their emotions as a tactic. They might be really the type of person that gets upset, gets very mad, gets gets uh, gets angry, and when that when that happens, you got to diffuse the situation. You might do that by taking a break, taking a breather. Listen, this is you know we're we're both kind of getting hot under the collar. Let's take a let's take a half an hour break and 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 uh, and go have a have a, a a cup of coffee or whatever um, if, if, if that might be a, a way to do it switch the subject let's 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 table that issue talk about something else but whatever you do when somebody the, the angrier somebody else is getting in order to diffuse that situation the more calm you should become you're again not to mirror their 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 emotional state but to to offset it with just the opposite, has a, a can be very calming. It also also can be very uh, uh, enraging to the other party. If you're if you're calm, don't let it get to you. Don't let it get to you. Well, the, that that reminds me of um, what David Sandler once said. Uh, I had the privilege of interviewing him, and he said selling is a Broadway play directed by a psychiatrist. That's great. That's great. It's a great quote. It's also very true. Right. Um, so final question. Um, there are actually two more. Um, is there ever a good way? Uh, is it a good idea to try to get a buyer to explain the specifics of why they think a price is too high? Yes, of course. Of course. And okay. a lot of times they 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 won't be able to do that. They won't be able to to give you a, a good reason. They might just say that because the X Y Z is cheaper. But you know, I, I don't. The, the, the buyers know that you get what you pay for. Somebody might be cheaper, but you're probably not getting the same thing. The pack the price might be the same, but the price package isn't the same. So if you can get them, if if they're if they are really really hammering on price, if that's really the, the issue, if price is really the issue have them tell you why and 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 then you can show the value of what you're making of what you're making. yeah well skip uh, i'm i'm really in awe with uh, your rich experience uh, base and, uh, and knowledge about the subject of negotiation and i would recommend uh, can you back up the slide um, i would recommend that anybody who wants to learn more about how to become a better negotiator uh, to connect with Spark X IQ. Um, and uh, remember, the phone number for Mark Roberts is 330-413-8552. And uh, Mark is happy to uh, uh, talk with you and explore new ways on how your sales force can win more deals. And um, I also want to make sure that everybody knows we're going to share the slides with you. We got everybody who participated. will get an email with a link uh, to the recorded presentation. And I want to thank everybody for participating with fascinating questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.